All righty. So Christiane Wolf, we have met before. We did an Instagram live together and you are a specialist in pain, but you have a really interesting personal history in that you uh, are a medical doctor, you're an MD, PhD, and now you're working more in the realm of mindfulness. So I'm really excited to talk with you about how you approach pain, um, both chosen pain and, and unchosen pain today. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So before we were, we were chatting um, a little bit about you run ultra marathons and I said marathons and you said, wait, no, I run ultra marathons. So, uh, so on the one hand that that's an example of sort of chosen pain. And then you also have this history of, um, working in, uh, was it oncology? Mm -hmm. Gynecological uh, oncology. Gynecological yeah. oncology. So working yeah. with cancer patients who are experiencing pain in a, in a different realm. So help, let's just start with this conversation about pain and, um, chosen pain, not chosen pain, how, we, how our perception impacts our experience of pain. I think I've been really just very fascinated or interested in pain for a really long time. And when I started to come across or learned about like the Buddhist teachings, um, which basically if you boil it down is like how to get out of pain um, and that life is actually... Um, it's you can't live life without pain so that really got my attention because like even as a teenager when i first encountered these teachings it was very obvious to me that yeah that like there is pain in life there is no life without pain and how we are dealing with that how we're coping with that how we are like making sense of meaning out of that actually is essential to how we live our lives or are we just keep running from the pain and trying to avoid pain and so just the methods were just always as i said very fascinating to me like we have a like a kind of um like an equation that kind of really expresses that well, that says um, suffering equals pain times resistance. And um, this is from Shinzen Yang. I didn't come up with that. <laughs> and he's a, he's a mindfulness teacher, but I think it's just like really expresses beautifully, at least like for my mind, that um, usually we say like pain and suffering is the same, but it's not. And everybody who has ever had a pain experience, which is everybody, can probably say that if you're struggling with the pain, if you're resisting it or worrying about it, your suffering goes up, right? So the more resistance or the more um, worry there is about the pain, the more suffering goes up. If you don't resist the pain or if you don't worry about it, the suffering will go down. And then we can even go that far that we say, like, if there's zero resistance or zero worry about the pain, suffering is zero. I mean, if you just play with the mathematical equation. And I would teach that often in my classes and people go like, what? Wait, wait. And then we'll really try to find things where there is pain, but no suffering. And just the fact that that is possible is kind of mind blowing to me. Yeah. So Pain, but no suffering. I mean, the things that I think about in terms of that or my personal experience of that is childbirth being one yeah. of them. Yes. And I had two C-sections, but I labored through both of them. And my preparation for childbirth was uh, kundalini yoga. Mm -hmm. So in kundalini, we do these kriyas where you do something like hold your arms out in front of you and cross them one over the other. And you, at the beginning, it feels like nothing, but you know, yeah, 20, 21 minutes in, <laughs> oh my gosh, you're yeah, starting to feel would. some pain. And, yeah, and yeah, the reason yeah. why they would teach us that is how to be present with this extreme discomfort, yes, but not suffer yeah. in it. Yeah. And today we're talking more about physical pain. And and what's interesting is that really the lines between physical and emotional pain cross, and yes. They activate the same areas of the brain and our yes. responses to both of them. It seems like the same response is helpful yes. for both acceptance yes. and allowing. Yeah. But let's talk about physical from a medical perspective to start. And then we can move into the Buddhist perspective and some of the ACT perspective of physical pain in the body and what happens, like how it translates into and changes into even chronic pain, like where that where physical pain turns into chronic pain 
in the brain and body. Yeah, I mean, to come back to the um, question about like chosen pain and pain that we're kind of, we haven't chosen, that makes a huge difference because it's all about like how we're seeing it, how we're embracing it. Um, and so the interesting thing is that, so if we look really just from a body perspective, like we have like these, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we have um, like nerve fibers, they're called nociceptors. A lot of people have heard about that. And I think they're pain receptor or like they're, they're pain fibers that are like kind of signaling there's pain in the body. But what's very interesting is noce actually doesn't mean pain it means danger and so what the body's job is or the of the periphery in particular is to give the uh, signal of danger to the brain like to higher functioning regions so that they can make sense of it and that's really interesting and what we know is so basically so like there, there is like uh, an interpretation that happens and so then the brain says that is pain or that is not pain, that's just uncomfortable. And so, and what we know, so in the beginning, when you just have like an, I don't know, like you cut your finger or something, right? So that is like very acute pain. And there's a direct correlation between like how much you hurt yourself and how much it hurts. So if you have a, like, you just like prick your finger with a needle, that's like a little pain. And if you cut your finger cutting vegetables or something, that's a big pain. So, and that is broken in chronic pain. Very interesting. The problem is that we don't really understand it. So we think we experience a high level of pain and therefore there must be a lot of damage in the tissue or it must be a lot of damage in the body, but that is not accurate. And of course, a lot of pain feels at first very uncomfortable, like we hate that, we want to get away from it. And it really makes us scared because we're coming from this acute pain model thinking like if there's a lot of pain, there must be a lot of danger, there must be a lot of damage in the body. The interesting thing is so we're saying that um, acute pain is protective and chronic pain is overprotective. Because our brain, like one of the jobs of our brain is, is to keep us safe. And so the brain tries to anticipate something that could harm us, that could be like where we could be in danger. And so in a way, it becomes more and more sensitized and starts to ring the pain alarm bell sooner and sooner with the areas where like people who have never experienced that, they actually would say like, well, that's not pain. So the brain, unfortunately, really, really changes in that way. That's such an important point because our response to acute pain may therefore be different than our response to chronic pain in the sense that if you have acute pain, you probably need to tend to the pain. You need to yes. pay attention to it, yes. tend to the wound, take yes. care of it, go to the doctor, yes. Yes. Uh, avoid the thing that's causing the acute pain. Yes. But with chronic pain, it's actually the over attention and the avoidance and the interpretation of this being dangerous that gets us into the problems associated with our chronic pain. Yes. And uh, what, one of the things that you write about in terms of Outsmart Your Pain, which is your book, and it's fantastic because it's not just talking about pain. It gives all of these meditations and strategies and techniques to, um, and they're really biopsychosocial, spiritual approaches yes. to pain. Yes. Um, but you talk about how there's the there's a sensation of pain and then there's our thoughts about pain and our emotions in relationship to the pain that really um, influence our experience of it. And I would add from a, like an act perspective, also our behaviors around pain. So this first part is like the, the how your body is interpreting, you know, is this pain, is this danger? And then let's talk a little bit about the thoughts, like how, how thoughts influence. Well, yeah, I mean, we already know like thoughts, they, and how much we believe our thoughts, like heavily influences everything. It creates our world. And um, I have, a, so I call that the pain story. And it is like, a, like people find that very helpful. And so just to kind of become aware of, so as you're like, let, let's say your, your pain is starting up. Let's say you had like a period where there was like no pain or just very little pain and the pain starts again. And in that moment, your alarm bells in your brain are going off. And then what happens is what the brain does, it goes into the past and into the future. 
So usually, the, so there's like, let's say like you have lower back pain and you were fine and then you wake up in the morning and there's something in your lower back and your brain goes like, oh, right, that thing. And then it goes into what happened in the past. Some of us go more into the past. Some of us go more into the future, but and a lot of us do both. So it's a combination, but to start to see like, okay, so what's my brain telling me when that is coming up? So it could be like, oh, last time that happened, I lost a week of work and I can't, I can't afford to lose more work. So, and I like, what helped this or last time it was really bad. And then, and it goes into the future is like, I might lose my job. I might not be able to provide for my family. And these things, thoughts, if thoughts were just that, that would be fine. But thoughts trigger emotions. So then the question is, so when these thoughts are coming up about the past or the future, what, how does that make you feel? And people go like, oh, anxious, overwhelmed, angry, frustrated, helpless, um, defined. I mean, like all these things. And where do we feel that? In the present moment. And so there is the physical sensation. And then like our mind layers, like the past story, thoughts and emotions on top, and the future thoughts and emotions on top. And of course, that has an influence on how we are in like feeling how that feels, what comes from the body in that moment. And we can work with that. And then there's a part that is um, also really, really important. So we've like we're finding that people with chronic pain, and like the people who are listening, they can check for themselves because it hurts. We're trying to avoid not feeling that. And what happens is that we actually stop feeling into the actual sensations of the body. So then we kind of go like, oh, there's the back pain, but we're not really open, curious, going like, but what does that actually feel like? It just becomes like this box that we call pain, and we really try not to go too close. And so then we are often just feeling the pain kind of from a memory point of view. And then the inflation with, of course, the, the thoughts and the emotions around that. So in many ways, the pain becomes like the monster in the closet or the, you know, the thing that's under the bed. And, um, and you don't really know what's in there or what it looks like because you've shut it out and then, but you've created all these stories about it and yes. then you have all these emotions with it. And what's interesting about um, interoceptive awareness, which is what we're kind of alluding to here, is the, the awareness of what's happening in your body. Mm -hmm. Not just your mind's interpretation of what's happening, yes. but actually yes. a body-based awareness. So we can have attention that's our sort of prefrontal cortex attention to things. Like I'm paying attention to the content of this interview, everything that Christiane is saying, and I'm understanding it. But then we can have a body-based attention, which is how, what's happening in my body as Christiane is speaking. Do yes. I notice that my heart rate is going up or that my heart rate is going down? And what's interesting about interoceptive awareness is that when we have greater levels of interoceptive awareness, we actually have greater resilience. There's some good research coming out of UCSD around athletes that athletes actually um, that have greater interoceptive awareness have less um, activation in brain areas when they are stressed. Um, and same thing with uh, traders, like traders on uh, Wall Street with mm -hmm. greater interoceptive awareness, they actually trade better during high stakes um, situations. So it's like the super skill, but we actually turn it off when pain shows up. We don't want to go there. Yeah. It's scary for us to go towards the pain or into our body. Yeah. How do you work with people in, in sort of befriending the sensation, the sensation level? Yeah. So one thing I just want to add that as you're mentioning athletes, I want to come back to my own athletic <laughs> endeavors because interoception is so important in mindfulness practice and um so as an endurance athlete like of course discomfort and and pain will come up and define for us what an ultra marathon is so what is, an ultra marathon? Yes. <laughs> what is an ultra marathon <laughs> an ultra marathon an ultra, mar <laughs> an ultra marathon is any distance that's longer than a marathon distance okay so marathon distance is 26.2 miles and so the shortest uh, ultra marathon distance is 30 miles. 
Okay. And then you can go further up. Um, and I'm not going to ask you for your age, but my guess <laughs> is that you're over 30. <laughs> I am over 30. Yes. Okay. But it's actually, there's, this is really beautiful. There is like a, a huge field of especially women and postmenopausal women in uh, ultra marathons and in endurance sports, because it's like our bodies are really, really can endure a lot if you use the word endurance here. Yeah. So it's it's really wonderful. And it's something, I mean, and the ultra marathon, another thing I should say, it's out on the trails. So marathons are usually run off on a street and ultra marathons are out in on the trails in the mountains. And that is like one of the things that really is wonderful for me because I love nature. And I love moving my body. And so it's that combination. But I, what I wanted to talk about is really like the interoception and the pain. So I was just running actually a race just a couple of weeks ago. And I noticed that at some point, um, and I have to say, I personally don't suffer from chronic pain. So chronic pain being defined as anything that lasts longer than six months. Um, but so my body doesn't have like the, the hyper um, the overprotective part. But so I noticed that pain was arising in my lower back. And what I did was I used the practices that I'm teaching of just like, what does that actually feel like? So going really close in and what are the actual sensations? And then what was really interesting to see is that the pain or what my brain registered as pain went away. And it was just intense sensations. And I thought like, oh yeah, that works. So I helped kind of my brain like reinterpret the, uh, make a reinterpretation of what was going on in that particular moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were looking at a painting, you could look at it and consider it to be ugly, or you could just look at the colors in the painting. <laughs> and you know, you're taking away that interpretation and yes. at the pure level of sensation. Yes. What does it feel like in my lower back right now? Like, yes. And we can all do that even as we're listening. There's yes. sensations in your body. Yes. Maybe uncomfortable ones at any point in time. Yeah. And getting into it and being present with it as opposed to interpreting it. Yeah. yeah. And the interesting thing is so, and then coming back to like chronic pain. So but people often when they have like pain and people go like, so how's your pain? They will say, oh, it's terrible yeah. or it's killing me. That is not a sensation. That is an interpretation, but you have to live with the idea that there's something inside of you that is killing you or that is terrible and that you can't get away from. And I think just like what we're creating, so the internal climate, and if we're thinking about like the whole language around like pain treatment is like, we talk about painkillers. Yeah. So... I think it's it's because we're listening. We're listening how we're talking to ourselves. So it might be just very interesting to see, like, so how how are you talking about your pain? And and it, I know the idea might be very scary to think, like, um, if I so because people often have this confusion around, like, when we say, like, can you accept? this moment as it is, what we're really doing with the teachings is because it already is the way it is. And right now you can change it. And then people think that's resigning. Mm -hmm. And it actually is not. And we're also saying in the practices, can I be with this or can I allow this to be here because it already is um, just for this moment? So I'm actually not asking anybody to accept this for ever which often then people say like, but that means it will never go away. And it doesn't do that at all. It's just like right now you're suffering, you're struggling. And what would change if internally you could say like, okay, I'm allowing this to be here right now. Because what we do is we actually take back control. Instead of saying this is kind of happening to me or this is being done to me, which feels terrible because it's completely out of my control. What I'm saying now, I take back control by saying like, I'm allowing this to be here. And that's the power of choice. Yes. Because you, you can't necessarily choose whether or not you're going to feel discomfort or sensation no. or pain in your lower back. Well, you can just don't run ultra marathons and your chances will go down, <laughs> but um, we can't choose some of, yeah. some of the pain that happens to us. Yeah. Like, 
but we can choose how much space we make for it and, and whether our willingness is there to have it. And part of that is also, I think, choosing to expand our experience to include the sensation, but not have it be all about the sensation. Because you talked about running on a trail. There's pain in your lower back, but there's also probably the sound of your footsteps on this yes. or the smell or the the view when you look out at the horizon and you connect yeah. to something that's bigger than than this moment. And that's what can happen with what in my experience of pain. I, I do have chronic pain um, experience migraines. I've had migraines since I was 17 and I get probably one or two a month. Um, and then I also have scoliosis. So I often have mm-hmm. some discomfort in my back. Mm-hmm. And what I find is that when I'm really hooked by the pain and my story about it, it becomes like huge. It, yes. It's like all I can think about. And it's and then everything is about sort of adjusting to make it go away. So like if I sit this way, is it a little bit less? Or if I sit this way or if I, you know, put on my glasses and shut the shades. And what what happens is that when we spend a lot of time managing or controlling the pain rather than taking control of our life and our willingness, our lives get really narrow. And it's almost yes. like the pain now is what's running the show and is dictating how I live as opposed to me choosing to have the pain there. And, um, and then, you know, it's sort of like carrying it in our back pocket yeah. in some way. It's really important. So there's like making a choice or what's our intention, because one thing we have to just know is like nothing gets our attention like pain does. And that is actually, so remember, the, your brain's job is to keep the body safe. So pain will always go to the top of, if there's pain, will always go to the top of it, the attention. Mm-hmm. And what it does, just like you're saying, it collapses around the pain. And everybody who has pain knows. So if you have like an injured shoulder, it feels like you're just that shoulder. Like everything else is kind of gone. And so part of our practice is that we're open that. So we're not saying like, we're not pretending the pain isn't there. It is, but we can open. And really there are like practices where you really go like, how about the rest of the body? How about my feet? Oh, my feet are fine. How about my lower legs? My lower legs are okay. And so, and what you do is you rebalance. So you say like a yes. And yes, there is the pain and right. So you put it into perspective and you like really deliberately keep opening it back up. And we do that with, with pain, but we do that like with chronic pain or physical pain, but also like with like the things that we're obsessing about in our minds, the things that we can't stop thinking about, for example, right? So we can say like, yeah, there's a lot of activation in the mind around that. And, and in that way, we're actually, the more we're able to check into our bodies, the more we're able to check out of that loop. Right. So often what I see people do is so uh, chronic pain, emotionally or physical is like they argue with themselves. Right. So like one part thinks this and the other thinks this and they're fighting and all the time, like we're not embodied at all. And so to keep in mind that every, every time we're noticing there's thinking happening to say like, thank you, not now. And then really bring the awareness to a part in the body that is not in pain or that feels safe. So I work with people finding like a safe place in the body. So that's not in pain. That's not threatening for some people. It can be like their feet or their hands or can be the belly, like a belly can feel like very safe. And right. So to see, and then that is where you come back to could be the breath. And so you switch kind of channels. So you train your mind in a way like we're, we're saying, like uh, from where I'm sitting is it actually doesn't matter what your thoughts are. Because as you're like engaging with thinking, you're trying to solve the problem on the level of the problem. And there is definitely a place for that. And it's very effective at some point. But when you're really in the grasp of that, you're just... Yeah, you're, you're fighting with yourself. You're arguing with yourself. And would there be, you know, I'm kind of aware of if I have pain in my back and I'm bringing attention to my big toes. For me, it would also be recognizing that my big toe and my back are part of something together. 
you know, like that I'm not just escaping my back and trying to live in my big toe all the time and be like, just pay attention to the big toe. Just forget about the fact you have a back. (laughs) But but actually seeing that there is it's sort of like a a whole landscape of of my inner experience where there's parts that are painful, there's parts that are completely numb. Like I haven't visited that part of my body in ages. I didn't even know that like my side ribs existed until I do like a yoga class and you breathe into them. But but that I'm sort of able to have flexibility in my attention. Yeah. Because sometimes we do need to pull our attention away from the intensity of the pain and put it somewhere safe. And then sometimes we need to bring our attention to the pain so we yes. can work with it. Yes. And that's again that sort of that's your choice of how you're doing that. When you're running, I'm a runner too. And um and sometimes it it is like I, I just don't want to pay attention to that, you know discomfort no. there because yes. it's going to, all my energy is going to go into that and I'm yeah. going to like have a you know kind of terrible run. So it's more about that you are choosing where you place your attention and that you can find places of safety or peace or neutrality, even in the presence of pain, yes. whether that's emotional pain or, or physical pain. 